five, Shannon. I'm going to read the next bit now. Thanks ever so much to Adam, Olivia, Ethan and Anaya P because it really helped me want to do it again because I felt a bit silly. So I'm going to carry on now and we're going to start the next section of the book. Then what are we waiting for? said Robin, setting his heels against his horse's side. And the five of them rode into the valley, splashed through a stream at a canter and thundered over a drawbridge into the castle courtyard. Armed men rushed at them from every side. We are from the court of Prince John of England, Robin cried, brushing aside the spear pointed at his chest. We have come to pay King Richard's ransom, but we will only pay for it when we see the king brought out alive and well. We will see your money first, Englishman, said a voice from the top of the steps. The soldiers backed away instantly. I would not trust an Englishman as far as I could spit. And the man threw his cloak about him and he came down the steps towards him. And who are you to insult us so? Robin asked. The Duke of Austria, the man replied. And you? He is Robin of Loxley, said Friar Tuck, dismounting slowly. And I am his friar, and my bottom is sore. And where is the ransom? You have no baggage. These are fine horses, replied Robin, are all the ransom you will get. They are worth at least a hundred thousand pounds. Your price for our king, I believe. An English joke. The Duke's hand was on his sword now. A bad English joke. At this, Friar Truck stopped rumbling, rubbing his bottom, and suddenly, before anyone could stop him, his sword was in his hand, and he lunged towards the Duke, lifting his chin with its point. No joke, he snarled. I'm not laughing, am I? Now, by God's good grace, you will do as I say, or I shall separate your dukely head from your dukely body. The Duke of Austria waved back his men. Tell your soldiers to lay down his, their weapons, said Friar Tuck, and Little John and M Much made quite sure that every one of them did. Now, said Robin, bring me Richard the Lionheart, and you shall have these horses, which are full payment for the ransom, as I have promised. You will see, when you examine the horses, that I do not break promises. In return, I shall want fresh horses, and your word on the Holy Bible that we shall be able to leave this castle and this country unhindered. The Duke made the oath on Friar Tuck's Bible and gave the order for the king to be brought up. He had little choice, for Friar Tuck's sword was never far from his throat, so they waited there for the king as the first snows of winter began to fall. The man who stumbled, blinking into the courtyard some minutes later, looked more like a beggar than a king. Emaciated, almost beyond recognition, he walked slowly, unsteadily, towards them over the cobbles. Little John ran to his side to support him. The king looked up at him. Little John, he smiled, and then Blondel was there too on his knee before his beloved king. Dear friend, said the king, how can I ever thank you? Thank Robin Hood and his outlaws, sire, said Blondel. It is they who have done this. I just pointed the way. And so in that cold courtyard, Tuck still guarding the Duke, and with snowflakes falling all about him, Richard the Lionheart met Robin Hood. Sire, said Robin, weak though I know you are, we must leave at once. Fresh horses are being brought. We leave these behind in payment for your ransom. Five horses for a king, said the king. Hardly a king's ransom, is it? Robin bent to lift one of the ho their hooves. Each one of their shoes is of solid gold, gold raised in Sherwood to bring you home. Can you believe it, sire? But this goat of an Austrian duke thought we were trying to cheat him. Fresh horses were being led into the courtyard now. Saddled and ready, little John and Blondel helped the king up into his saddle. Tuck, said Robin, let the duke have his poxy head on your horse and we'll be away. And he strode over to the Duke of Austria, who was clutching his throat, his face pale with fear. All you have to do, my lord, is to take the horses, uh, the shoes off all, all our horses, and you will find your ransom paid in full. We have our king, you have your gold. Everyone is happy. You will not mind if I take your cloak for my king. So you are Robin Hood, said the Duke, taking off his cloak and handing it to Robin. I have heard of you and know you to be a loyal and honourable man. Your king does not deserve you, as you will one day find out. These words echoed in Robin's head time and time again as they rode home. He was not to forget them. Every day they travelled, every meal they ate, every night they slept, the king grew in strength. 
At night he would sit by the fire and tell them of his crusades in the Holy Land, of the battles he had won, the castles he, he had besieged, of his enemy Saladin, of whom he spoke with more respect and even affection than his allies. They heard of the treachery of the Duke of Austria and how the other uh, crusading kings and princes quarrelled endlessly amongst themselves. He would not rest, he said, until Jerusalem was in Christian hands again. Then Blondel would sing, and he would sing, and they all would all sing, and the king had scarcely been in England over the last ten days, ten years, and as they rode he quizzed them endlessly on the state of his kingdom. They told him of the injustices wreaked upon the people by Prince John and his sheriffs up and down the land of the Sheriff of Nottingham in particular, and Sir Guy of Gisborne, how they drove the people from their homes, of the starvation and deep poverty, of the torture and mutilation all done in the King's name. And when alone with the King, Blondel, Blondel spoke of all the good that Robin and his band of outlaws had done. The King listened to them all, but even while he was listening, he seemed restless, looking past them or through them even as they spoke. He would deal with the Seraph of Nottingham on his return and Sir Guy of Gisborne too. That much he did promise. Well, such terrible deeds he could not and would not go unpunished. But his brother was his brother and though he acknowledged he was weak, he would hear no more against him. The crossing was calm this time, to Robin's great relief, but he stayed out on deck all, t all the same. He felt better that way. On the last morning at sea, he found the king suddenly beside him. As soon as I can, Robin, he said, I will come to Sherwood. I owe you that much and more besides. I shall see to it that your outlaws are free again. Their virtue and their courage will have its reward. Have no fear. And the Sheriff of Nottingham and Sir Guy of Gisborne will have their just deserts, I promise you. He gazed out towards the white cliffs of Dover and sighed deeply. I was not born a king, Robin. He had lived, had he lived, my older brother would have been king in my place. I do not want the crown. I am a soldier. Never happier than in a fight. And no cause is more dear to me than the capture of Jerusalem. How else does a soldier find his way to heaven unless he fights for God? I was not made for a comfortable court, for the niceties of diplomacy, nor the machinations of the ambitious ministers and counsellors. But your people, said Robin, they need you at home. The king shook his head. No, they need people like you, Robin. You should have been a king, not me. And he walked away. It was the dawn of Christmas Day when they arrived last in London and rode through the silent streets up to the tower. The guard at the gate stood staring, open-mouthed. I am no ghost man. I am your king. Have the gate opened and send for my brother. He'll be in bed. He always was a late riser. Sitting on his throne with Blondel at his feet, Richard the Lionheart waited for his brother in silence. On one side of him stood Robin and Much. On the other side, Little John and Friar Tuck. They heard the doors opening and closing upstairs, urgent whisperings, running feet, and then the solitary figure of Prince John on the staircase, wrapping himself in a sable-trimmed gown. Come down, John, said the king. I shall not eat you, and neither will Robin Hood, though he has cause enough, I believe. I am home again, Brother John. The pants ransom paid. What? Are you not glad to see me? I have come home to wish you a happy Christmas. Don't worry, I will not stay for long this time, for I have business in Sherwood Forest, urgent business that cannot wait. Don't stand there gaping. Come and embrace your brother, John. Or should I call you Judas? And that is the end of the chapter. We'll start chapter 10 tomorrow.